What's going on, everybody? Eric Lindquist at Stochastic here on the Odd Chopper channel coming to you with another edition of Lenny's Leans, Lakes, and Locks NFL edition. Hit that like button, subscribe button, notification bell. Goes a long way for me on this video. Goes a long way for you. That way you become a prize whenever great content is going live here at our little neck of the YouTube woods. I've had a lot to do here on this Friday. Getting ready for week two in the NFL streets. I'm a little depressed. My Minnesota Vikings, you just kind of knew what was happening. And of course, I had to watch that football game Thursday night with some of my dear closest friends who are all Eagles fans. Hey, Kirk Cousins looked great. Justin Jefferson still being just fantastic, but dumbest rule in sports. Fumble at the one inch line goes out. Just disaster, disaster. Anywho, we're moving on to Sunday. Sunday bets, that's what we're going to be focusing on. We did hit the lock on Thursday there with the Jordan Addison play. Happy with that. You can check out my article for every single primetime game. That's going to be how we handle these going forward. But Sunday, I took your feedback. And Sunday, I'm going to incorporate that primetime game. Sunday night, going to be here on the card for you. So we'll talk a little New England, a little Miami. Could it be a good time? Could it be a good time? That's for sure. But also a good time checking out Caesar Sportsbook if you haven't already for the first week of the uh, NFL season. Basically, you bet $50 at the link below. You're going to get yourself $250 in the form of five $50 bonus bets, one that will hit your account instantly, and then four more that will hit every single Monday. So little Monday night football ammunition, if you ask me. It's only for 21 and over, and if you have a gambling problem, please call 1-800-GAMBLER. But I'm going to break down every single Sunday, Sunday game from beginning to end. Uh, the Alpha and Omega. Look at that. We're going to like Greek alphabet. Anywho, we got producer Jacob. Excited to have him here for the first time. Because, again, I, I, I pseudo made believed that he was here last time. No offense to him. He's a lovely person. He deserves vacation. I deserve vacation. I should probably take one of those sometime, huh? Probably not. Too many sports. So little time. Friends, it's week two in the NFL streets. Producer Jacob, let's get ourselves to the picks. First up, we've got the Chargers and Titans taking place in Nashville, Tennessee, a city I've somehow never been to and probably should have back when I was single because I've heard stories. Anyways, starting with the road Chargers, what a disappointing debut for one offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore, who I thought did a lot of the heavy lifting for the Cowboys days during the Mike McCarthy era. But despite optimism for him here in this spot, thought he might open the playbook for star quarterback Justin Herbert. They ended up running the ball a robust 42.5% of the time in their week one defeat at home to the Miami Tyree kills. That's what they shall be known as. We'll cover them later. Further explaining that disappointment after a 2022 season where Herbert had a career low 6.8 yards per attempt. Uh, it's mainly problematic play calling during that. Brandon Staley handing over duties and then firing offensive coordinators, bringing in Kellen Moore. Well, he averaged all 6.9 yards per attempt in week one. So... Not much changing there. Now, to be fair, Mike Williams missed himself some snaps, getting checked out in the medical tent that, you know, he's their main vertical threat. That's going to be somebody that is going to help move the ball uh, in, in that right. But the point remains, it was overly conservative play calling, in my opinion. And you hope that changes it. more of an aerial attack is kind of what you need against this putrid second uh, secondary from the Titans. But might have to just be by default as the major piece of injury news in this one revolves around do it all back Austin Eckler he seems more than likely not to not play in this one and in fact we just got the news doubtful to be playing here all of about 30 minutes ago the Chargers star without him there it's gonna be Joshua it's gonna be just tons of Joshua Kelly that's a downgrade in the passing game for sure but perhaps it gives Herbert the freedom to push the ball downfield more too or, you know, we'll just continue watching one of the best talents in the NFL wasting away in Margaritaville with quick slants to Keenan Allen about 500 times a game until Allen's hamstring in inevitably falls out of his body. And then, you know, as for the Titans, never ideal when Ty J Spears outsnaps Derek Henry at the running back position for your team. That's because it usually means they're trailing and they need to bring somebody in for pass catching duty. But hey, bright side. DeAndre Hopkins looked good, comfortable, efficient in the passing game. Well, not really efficient, 13 targets, but seven catches against Marshawn Lattimore and the Saints. Not so bad, but it's a little less bright here on Friday as Hopkins did not participate in practice and is very much in danger of missing Sunday's game. Personally, I'd call it 51-49 with the ever so slight lean towards him playing because then it could be maintenance related for the veteran wide up, but we'll see. Definitely news to monitor here. At either rate, my interest in this game lies solely in props 
I'm not going to be backing a road favorite Chargers team hanging a field goal or two and a half, nor am I willing to make a stand on this 45 total with Hopkins and Eckler's status in peril. But big Mike Williams, friends, said it earlier. He missed a few series. He was getting checked out in concussion protocol, but he still managed to have a four for 45 line to salvage. But what's most notable to me, 16.1% target share. That is just well north of 20% when you factor in the time that he missed. And while I don't rate the Dolphins secondary all that highly, they look like a bunch of sauce gardeners out there compared to the Titans secondary. But the main reason this play is just a lean here is because second year corner Roger McCreary looked improved on tape and should be getting the Mike Williams matchup in this one. Still, the Titans defense allowed all of 282 passing yards against the Saints, picking up right where they left off last season as one of the more exploitable pass funnels in the NFL. So I'll simply be monitoring this number, see if there's any improvements, but more than likely just going to be a lean on the over 57 and a half receiving yards. It's a prop, something that grades out okay, just not on the card as of right now. Keep your eye on it leading into Sunday. Oh, darling, this one projects out as a shootout. 51 total high. How are you this fine day? Projects as a shootout. Massive news dropped Friday. Massive news. Travis Kelsey, good to go. We'll play in week two. Now, I looked into the hyperextension of the knee mainly because, well, you couldn't avoid the conversation of it in the aftermath of that Kansas City debacle where everybody's just dropping. We'll get to that. But I think Travis Kelsey plays closer to a full allotment of snaps than being monitored in any way, shape, or form. So that bodes well for Kansas City because he's kind of confirmed important to this football team because we saw Sky Moore be less. We saw Kadarius Tony look like Tony the Tiger, only the opposite, you know, there's shit. Said a great couldn't catch the ball <laughs> anyway jackson laville they look pretty good on the offensive end of the ball that's for sure it's absolutely for sure and i'm not sure what to make of the splits because you saw calvin ridley be that dude immediately and i think christian kirk zay jones they're still gonna have their places in the offense not exactly that exciting to see if you're a travis etn owner that mr uh, tank bigsby ends up closing out the game and is in there on series at the end of that game they are relying on the rookie right from the get-go. So those are things that I'm kind of keeping track of. But from a betting perspective, really hard for me to do anything with these numbers. And I do think Christian Kirk, he has to start getting targeted. He had too much rapport. He was too uh, well-suited for this offense to be sitting on the sidelines, or in this case, just running wind sprints. However, we are focused entirely on the Kansas City side. And I know these numbers have gotten inflated to like minus 130, minus 140 already, and they are trending up, up, up. But in any time, touchdown market is a very difficult one to beat. And yet there are two numbers that I find to be very inefficient this week. The first is Travis Kelsey. I know he's the most likely player to score a touchdown in this game, according to bookmakers. But I don't think he's being put at a number high enough. Now, I'm not going to be locking him simply because it's starting to trend towards this minus 150, minus 160 number. And by the time you listen to this, it might be difficult to get that kind of price. So be paying very close attention, friends. But... Want to be firing up Travis Kelsey. Yes, Travis Kelsey, my friends. Anytime touchdown, really great play here for Sunday. We're going to keep this one really clean and efficient, mainly because I love this football game for all you DFSers, for anybody single game parlaying something where you're just trying to jam in some overs together in a game that could shoot out. That's exactly what we saw last year in this exact same matchup, in this exact same scenario think it could really be what shows up next and also why is the nfl scheduling the same exact matchups for week twos like why are my vikings playing in philly back-to-back -back week twos why is my hair standing up in the middle like this the world may never know but you know what now we're just gonna mess it up we're just gonna mess it up for this portion just like they messed up these matchups like what are we doing we shouldn't have run backs of week two but Anywho, we've got Detroit. It opened at three, as you can see directly above me. Great work by your uh, producer, Jacob. Love that. Four and a half as it currently sits, mainly because uh, money flooding in on Detroit because of what they did against Kansas City and Seattle. They played the Rams, who weren't expected to do jack diddly squat without Cooper Cup. Well, Seattle just laid an egg. Seahawks laying eggs. What a time to be alive. But I think this game could be that kind of shootout potential where we could be looking at it over here, but it doesn't project out that way for me. I'm leaning towards thinking that, I mean, Seattle can't play any worse. Detroit 
probably couldn't have played any better. Got a lot of breaks by the hands of Sky Moore and, of course, Kadarius Tony. So just throwing it out there, Cop, this is really bad. This is really bad. Anywho, as I'm looking at things going across the board here, I do think Seattle, you've got to be relying on DK Metcalf and you got to get some incorporation. Tyler Lockett looked like you couldn't gain any separation whatsoever in that loss against the Rams. And then you go to the Detroit side, Jameer Gibbs, only 27% of snaps. You got to think that that's going to start increasing for their number 12 pick as time progresses. And for me, that's one of the major things I want to be paying attention to from a prop perspective. Where is David Montgomery's number sitting? Because Seattle, they're going to be exploitable in pretty much every single facet of defense because, well, they don't have anybody. And that's where I'm leaning four and a half. I wish I had jumped in on three along with it. Seems to be a lot of the consensus. We're looking at five and a halfs. We're looking at numbers all across the board. But having opened at three, I think this is something that I wish I had gotten on earlier. As a result, I'm happy to pass. You're not going to be able to hit on every single one of these markets, every single one of these lines early. But the ones you do, you want to be able to capitalize. I think we've got a couple of those on today's slate. But here just a tough game for me outside of hey if you want a single game parlay something jam some overs this one has that kind of upside i'm gonna be disagreeing it seems like with what the sharp money has been doing in this spot we have the green bay packers taking on the atlanta falcons atlanta falcons one of the stories Bijan robinson a lock from last time around he looked great tyler algier they basically said you know what if we're gonna be the score two scores in spots we're going to let Tyler Algier be the one who just runs into the back of the other team. He ends up with the two touchdowns, ends up getting a lot of work, 15 rushing attempts. Bijan Robinson cut it down, even though his ridiculous touchdown catch was something to behold. Had some single game parlay stuff that tried to mix in there for week one. I got a couple of those, here, but it seems like they're trending towards unders in a spot that we'll talk about a little bit later. But as it stands for Green Bay, one of the underrated things that I don't think enough people are talking about is how good Jordan Love looked to me. Did anybody else watch that Bears game? Because Jordan Love led all of the NFL in passer rating in week one, 123.2. And I don't think I've heard anything other than how good Aaron Jones looked. And Aaron Jones enters here questionable. I think he's probably not going to play. Going uh, A.J. Dillon now, that's a big downgrade at the running back position. But Christian Watson might get inserted into this one. He's making a push, a late push, uh, questionable to be playing. He didn't, he sat out last uh, for, for week one, but as we're looking forward, he's going to be that vertical threat, that go-to wide receiver. Romeo Dobbs could still be that guy, but I have to say Jordan Love got no love coming off of a pretty impressive performance when you watch the tape, when you pull that up in the old NFL Sunday ticket on YouTube TV. How many of us purchased that on Sunday morning? Everybody that's what I thought. But looking at this number, we've seen this go from minus one and a half to one, which, hey, that is in favor of me. But it seems as though there's a lot of sharp money coming in in the aftermath of Friday's practice report because Aaron Jones is a running back who absolutely 100% matters. But after Green Bay took money early in the week on people like me who jumped on this line, plus one and a half, that was the number I locked in. Now you're looking at one. I could see this number actually reverting back to the one and a half. So you can maybe sit around and wait for this to hit on Sunday. But as it stands, I'm okay with it as it as it is, as it stands. How many times can you say as it stands in one segment? More than once is the answer, but all you need is one here. A W by one or a loss by one to push it. Green Bay plus one and a half. That's the number that I'm really targeting in for you. Want a star highlight, make that very apparent to you. But Plus one, if this is the only number available to you on Sunday, happy to be taking that one here as well. Maybe just taking the minus one or two on the money line. I do think the Packers win this game, but when you're getting that extra point and a half for the minus 110, think it's worth it. Wait for that half hook if you can. How depressing is this? J.K. Dobbins. Doing the hot sauces video over on X. Yeah, if you don't know what I'm talking about, head to at Eric Lindquist, myself, my friend Aton Shander. We're giving you a mild play, a hot play, a, a medium play. We got them all smack dab together, but one of my major stands was J.K. Dobbins' two touchdowns. He gets one instantly, and now he's down for the year. So I feel like I did this to him, although he just gets hurt all the way by default. But another, another massive injury out for the season J.K. Dobbins, somebody that I thought was going to be a bell cow back if he could stay healthy, alas, 
not the case. Some people, they just don't have all the luck. Some guys have all the fame. I think that's Rod Stewart. Anyway, Bengals, they laid the ultimate egg. Well, actually, it would be the Giants technically that laid the ultimate egg. But the Bengals, Joe Burrow, the worst performance you're ever going to see him play perhaps ever in the NFL, unless he plays to like 45 years of age, but coming off of getting a $275 million contract, threw all of 82 yards with a 45.2% completion percentage in that week one loss to Cleveland. Now, Baltimore, they don't bring as much heat as Cleveland does on the defensive line, but it is still going to be a tough, tough spot. And this is just because you've got a running game that is now primarily based around Hill, around Gus Edwards. What are we doing here? It's going to be very, very pass centric compared to years to, to years past with Lamar Jackson offenses. And yet, I think they've got to rely a little bit on intertwining Lamar Jackson into this running game from the get go. And that's kind of a big stand that I'm going to have here. They're three and a half point dogs heading into Cincinnati. Cincinnati can't play worse on the offensive end. Joe Burrow gets another week of rehab on the calf. He was at least able to move to some capacity. And then you just break down the numbers here. And I see Lamar Jackson across the industry at 43 and a half rushing yards. Last week against Houston, where they're not asking him to go out and run, he puts up a flat 38 in six attempts. Six attempts, averaging 6.3 per carry. That's going to go up considering this Bengals defense. Yeah, they're decent enough, but... This is still a spot where Lamar Jackson is going to be your main catalyst to any successful running game, period. This offensive line, eh, they're okay. But I'm looking at Lamar Jackson as somebody who's going to have to do a lot of things on the road here in Cincinnati that he didn't get asked to do uh, going up against the Texans last week, especially in the aftermath of losing J.K. Dobbins. So Lamar Jackson, this is a pretty simple play for me. Straightforward for a half unit, nothing crazy. Don't forget that boy told you kick that over on 43 and a half rushing yards. We got a really interesting spot here and one that I've already slammed. I want to at least throw this out there. You got an interesting situation with CJ Stroud that popped up out of nowhere all of about an hour ago. He is now questionable for this spot, but in the event that CJ Stroud is active and playing in this football game on Sunday, you should be firing this bet up in bulk. And even still, this probably still grades out as a, a average play as is. So maybe a half unit followed by the full allotment in the event that CJ Stroud is in and officially active for Sunday's game. That's good enough. Awesome. Good talk. Glad we had it. Let's break it down. The Indianapolis Colts taking on the Houston Texans opened at two and a half. We are sitting at one and a half. And why might that money be coming in? I don't know. Maybe they could predict the future about CJ Stroud having an injury that he practiced in full with on Wednesday, practiced in full with on Thursday, and Friday, he's just sitting out. I'm hoping it's a maintenance day for him, if anything. Again, maybe it's just deception, trying to lie to the Colts. No coach has ever lied to us before. No, 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 no. Kyron Williams was always going to be the number one running back for the Los Angeles Rams, right? Coaches lie all the time. Just get used to it. It is what it is. We're going to have to go through the deception. And we got to figure out what's real, what's not. Something I think is real is this Houston passing attack and their focus on the wide receiver core. Because if Robert Woods can do the things he did last week, gain the separation, be targeted 10 times, be able to be a safety valve for the likes of a Nico Collins, who has a ton of talent, and then Tank Dell getting mixed into the mix, I think Houston could have an above average passing attack relative to expectations. Not saying that they're going to be top five, top 10 in the NFL by any means, but I'm not the biggest CJ Stroud fan, but this was a step in the right direction in a very difficult spot on the road in Baltimore for week one. As for the Colts, they could not have impressed me less going up against the Jaguars. There were some amazing plays that were made by Anthony Richardson with his legs, but it was still exactly what you expected from him where you're going to see the mistakes through the pick through the touchdown had the rushing touchdown you're going to get the good with the bad with him but zach moss going to be your primary back i'm assuming based on deon jackson's inefficiency in week one get this deon jackson had 18 touches and less than 30 total yards that is impossible for a running back to have something like that in their repertoire Zach Moss coming back from the broken arm. I do expect him to be closer to a bell cow uh, than what anything we saw last week with Deion Jackson was. So there's that. 
that's not ideal because he is not good. Zach Moss coming from the Buffalo Bills gave him up for a bag of potato chips at the tail end of last season to give him some run in the NFL. Hasn't really been the efficient back that he looked like he could be coming out of Utah in college. So I am not optimistic about Indianapolis's chances to do anything besides let Anthony Richardson rip it run around, make plays, do the kind of things that he needs to there. And this Houston defense is much, much improved when you look at some of their personnel. I really like Perryman in the middle there. Greenard and Anderson on both sides. Anderson Jr., one of the top 12 uh, defensive edge rushers based on week one performance, according to PFF. Everything for me, signs, seals, delivers that Houston at one and a half in the event C.J. Stroud is playing football on Sunday is my favorite spread that exists. And there are ones that exist as it stands right now too. So jump in on one, one and a half, two. If you get CJ Stroud in there, I'd be happy to lay anything short of the two and a half number at Standard Juice. You can wait for the Stroud news or you can be like me and try to bet this thing early thinking you're sharp and have something bite you in the ass. Either way, it's going to be exciting. Y'all. Caesar Sportsbook, bet $50, get yourself $250. Here's how it works. You go to the link below. You simply bet $50 on anything your heart desires in the NFL streets. You're going to get yourself five $50 bonus bets from Caesar Sportsbook. Now, a huge part of what I do, a huge part of what everybody does here at Odd Shopper is we shop for the best odds. We don't care if it's at Caesars or at BetMGM or DraftKings FanDuel, Bet365, points bet. If it is at a legal standardized sportsbook, and it is the best available line. That is where we're playing our picks. You should be doing the same thing. And, and hey, this is another sports book to add to the portfolio. So if you haven't signed up at Caesars, get access to it. Get yourself awesome rewards like $250 in bonus bets. But just saying, you're also going to get Caesars reward points. Those are viable in Vegas. Uh, you know, those are good times to be firing those up as well. So you get a lot of great secondary options here from Caesars Sportsbook that you don't always get from other places. So great opportunity to jump in, try a new product if you haven't already, and get a little cash in your pocket. In the meantime, get $250, yeah, five $50 bonus bets by betting just $50 over at Caesars at the link below today. Only if you're 21 and over, and if you have a gambling problem, please call 1-800-GAMBLER. Producer Jacob, back to the picks we go. Of course my Minnesota Vikings lost to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right? That was always gonna happen. Great. Anyway, this opened Chicago minus one and a half. Check it out now. Chicago plus two and a half things. The times they've been a change in people reacted to Tampa Bay in a pretty prominent way here in Chicago. Justin Fields you guys traded away the number one pick to be able to have DJ Moore go out and get targeted twice. DJ Moore is good. DJ Moore is confirmed good at football, and apparently Justin Fields just didn't want to throw the ball to him, and Chase Claypool didn't want to block. Don't even go look at those videos. They're so disappointing, unless you're a Viking fan, and yeah, Chicago, they can continue losing. But as you look at these numbers across the board here, Bears plus 120 on the road in Tampa, really, really solid defensive performance by the Buccaneers. You saw what they were able to do, the Minnesota Vikings were able to do against Philadelphia just in terms of an aerial attack on Thursday. Sure, they were without James Bradbury, their star cornerback who just isolated Justin Jefferson and made him do nothing in 2022 week two win. But just saying, still want to give props where it's due. And Minnesota's offense, not the problem. Not the problem at all on Thursday. And Bucks held them 17 nothing absolutely nothing going up against them shout out baker mayfield too just somebody who continues to win football games finds ways to be effective coming from the rams at the tail end of last season into a game what are we looking for like a game manager type quarterback for these bucks really solid stuff from him although you're not going to run into the gaudy numbers for mike evans and chris godwin that you saw under tom brady that should go without saying but again the whole matchup and this whole spot is predicated on what the Chicago Bears offense is able to do in a bounce back spot after looking completely lost, completely putrid against the Green Bay Packers. Justin Fields, 65% completed, 65% uh, completion percentage, but only 216 yards. Only safety valve was basically him rushing the football nine for 59. And you're not going to be able to do that 
against this Tampa Bay defense. They are too stout. They are too good. They are too disciplined. They've got a free roamer out there in Winfield Jr. who's going to be able to do whatever he wants. You've got a linebacking core led by Devin White, who is just awesome. And of course, Barrett, uh, Vea, all the guys on the defensive line there, they're going to create problems for this Bears offensive line. It's not going to be pretty, in my opinion. However, it's pretty efficient sitting at two and a half. I'm not all that interested in these props as these numbers are sitting very low on both the Bucks and Bears side. Pretty appropriate because when you talk about the difference between a mean projection and a median projection, it's always going to be a little bit less than what you think their average, dis like their average output is going to be because the average is not what we're interested in. We're interested in what the median outcome can be in some of these spots. So think about that going forward. We can have longer discussions about that on Lindy's Locks update over on X when I update you on any major uh, things that happen on Sunday mornings leading you into the NFL slate. But as it stands here, pretty simple for me to stay away from this football game at the current numbers. I'd lean Tampa Bay money line if you're looking for a little thing to add to a parlay. If you're looking for a little spice, a little garnish, if you will. But for the most part, this feels like a pretty efficient spot to just stay away from altogether. This is not a lock that we're about to present you here in this game, but it is the premier featured play of Sunday, and it is all thanks to producer Jacob being a real one. Hit that like button, if not for me, for my dude, who's bringing the absolute fire. But I brought one half of it, he brought the other half, and you know what? It's made to be perfect. We have the Vegas Raiders taking on the Buffalo Bills here. Buffalo... They just got done playing one of the top one or two defenses in all of the NFL in the Jets. Josh Allen, yes, he made poor decisions. Yes, they've had some interesting ends to the season in previous seasons, whether it was the Kansas City Gabe Davis eruption spot that didn't matter because it became Kansas City's uh, ridiculous overtime performance and all of those things into last season, just a train wreck at the end of that football game. And then this year, well... When you're a jet, you're a jet. Aaron Rodgers, my gosh. It's weird that I actually feel bad for him because I never thought that that feeling was possible. But it is possible to feel good for the Vegas Raiders coming out 1-0, winning in Denver in week one. A pretty interesting spot where Devontae Adams wasn't practicing in full, and now he's a full go, ready to rock. That's a very important piece to this football team, as is Josh Jacobs who's still a bell cow, 19 rushing attempts, pretty much got all of the work, all of the touches at the running back spot. Zamir White, still a distant, distant second, ended up on the field for one catch, one rushing attempt. It's all going to be him, but I want to focus in on another piece here. Let's start though on the Buffalo side then as a result, mainly because Stefan Diggs, he got his, he's going to continue to get his, but these numbers across the board are just efficient. I think shorting Gabe Davis is going to be the way to go about things as Khalil Shakir can get onto the field a little bit more. You have uh, Deontay Hardy, who ended up playing a little bit there too. Trent Sherfield coming from uh, Miami last season into a Buffalo uniform. Think he'll get acclimated. Gabe Davis has not done anything for a year and a half. He is out there running wind sprints. It's really frustrating unless you bet unders on him. So do that, okay? Hey, good idea. But that is not what I want to be keying in on here. I want to go to the wide receiver core for the Vegas Raiders, where you had a breakout performance for Jacoby Myers. And unfortunately, Jacoby Myers will not be suiting up for this one. Ended up in concussion protocol after a 10 target, nine catch, two touchdown performance up in mile high. Beautiful stuff out of Jacoby Myers coming from New England, strictly into another offense that obviously is familiar with the Bill Belichick. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. This is just incredible. We're about to bring poetry into motion. Hunter Renfro, he has to be on the field a lot more going forward here. It's just by default, with no Jacoby Myers out there. It's either him or DeAndre Carter, or we have Wilkerson. And for me, I think all of the attention goes directly to Hunter Renfro. All of the routes, all of the targets. I think he has to be stepping into a much, much larger role. And anybody who's familiar with him going back to Clemson into his time in the NFL, He's one of the most efficient, best route runners that there are, period. It's simply size. It's simply him getting the right uh, mismatches. And then also, the rapport was not necessarily there with Derek Carr. 
It just didn't seem to exist there at times. Jimmy Garoppolo, a fresh face. Sometimes that's what you need with this new coaching system, new quarterback. Maybe we can find a little something for him in the absence of one Jacoby Myers. I think this is a very low number to be going at 30 and a half. But friends, that's not all. We are going to parlay Hunter Renfro with Hunter Renfro. Noted lefty killer for the Cincinnati Reds, my friends. Yes, we are bringing MLB Lindy's. We are bringing NFL Lindy's. And we are putting those babies together. It's a beautiful time to be alive. We have Renfro with a W parlayed with the over of 0.5 hits. We have Renfro with an E taking on Jose Quintana here of the Mets. If you have a lefty on the mound, Hunter Renfro is going to be in that lineup. I might think about putting this as a home run, depending on what that number is. I uh, will develop a break-even number. I will be posting that in the premium Discord. But friends, what could be better than Renfro plus Renfro for a nice uh, W? Oh, shit. San Francisco 49ers taking on the Los Angeles Rams. And your boy over here. A puka nakua. What a wonderful phrase. A puka nakua. Ain't no person craze. It means all the targets for the rest of your days. Here's the problem. He's actually not practicing on Friday, but it sounds like he's going to be good to go. We're going to be given it a, the old college try, which they really want. They went up to Seattle. They did absolute work. How fun was that to watch? Actually, there were like four people probably watching that football game that aren't from Seattle area and then aren't Rams fans. There were probably more than four. It was NFL week one Sunday. Just saying. It was beautiful stuff. Tutu Atwell, don't go sleeping on him either. Six catches for 119 for the guy who was the only player out of a Power 5 conference amongst the wide receiver core. But I continued to say it, and I'll continue to say it again. Van Jefferson ain't that dude. That was the main reason that we went to Nakua Overs on receptions and re receiving yards. Did I expect a hundo out of him? Absolutely not. He got completely picked up by all of you across the way. We there was only one program in the entire world that was talking about Puka Nakua on Sunday, and it was probably mine. Just throwing it out there. All right, enough of that. I got so much shit wrong, too, and I'm happy to admit when I did. And One of the mistakes I made was not firing that San Francisco side. I said I had so much trepidation because everybody started to get on Pittsburgh. My buddy Aton's talking to me about Pittsburgh. Everybody... San Francisco's defense is elite, top three in the league. You've got offensive core position players where it could be Brandon Ayuk Day anytime. It could be Debo Samuel anytime. It could be Christian McCaffrey all the time. It's just ridiculous. And now this line has moved from six to seven and a half. I think it is rightly done so. Hopefully you were able to get on that one earlier. I was not. But this is what I want to be focused in on. I want to be focused in on the passing attack for the San Francisco side think we're going a little bit crazy here with this number for Brandon Ayuk in the industry. He was extremely efficient. Eight for eight, 129 yards, two touchdowns. He is completely out of Shanahan's doghouse. He was in it for basically his entire career up until like the tail end of last season. He's emerging as one of those guys, but George Kittle dinged up should have another week of being healthy under his belt. You have Debo Samuel, who's going to get involved in multiple different facets. You have on the other side, uh, the Rams team that I just, I think they were about as good as they could possibly perform there in week one. I think there is regression due for their passing attack in week two. Matt Stafford, he was awesome on the road there in Seattle, but Seattle secondary, a far cry from what we're going to see here. And then, of course, Bosa on that defensive line. Let's be dead serious, friends. San Francisco is the way better football team between these two. I hope it's competitive. I hope it's enjoyable. But the most, the thing that I hope most is that Brandon Ayuk regresses towards the means because there's no way that he is going to be going eight for eight in this spot. I will just eat my hand if he does. 10 for 200 incoming, that's for sure. Under four and a half receptions, the thing is grading out the best for me and grading out the best at Odd Shopper. And when those two come to alignment, my projections and Odd Shopper's market-based approach, I get really excited about plays. This one was borderline lock, ended up just firing a half unit, stayed disciplined on it here. We're going to stay the course. Again, keeping, uh, keeping the keep track of the props here. But Brandon Ayuk, I think this is a really good spot. And hey, hopefully you're able to get on the San Francisco minus six. I think I made a mistake not betting them yet again this week. To my favorite play and my favorite prop for this upcoming Sunday, we have the Giants 
we have the Cardinals. Did anything that you saw from the Arizona Cardinals surprise you in week one? Nothing, nothing. We expected that Josh Dobbs on like two and a half weeks of practice with this Arizona team after being traded from Pittsburgh over, that he was going to struggle, and he did. 132 yards in the air on 30 pass attempts, 21 completions. It is insane to complete 70% of your passes and only get 132 yards, but that speaks to some of his limitations, the limitations of this offense, the limitations of this defense. They are not very good across the board. We've all expected Arizona to be bad right from the get-go. They found moments of competition against Washington, really mucked it up for anybody who had anything inside of those three and a half tickets, four minus four tickets, like it opened months ago. Again, rip, rip to anybody who uh, followed me into the darkness later there at six and a half and seven, but it's okay. We can run it back, but I'm not going to be running it back here with the Giants at the spread, considering this has gone from what, five and a half, four and a half, Arizona's actually taking money in this spot. No, 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 no. That's not how we're going to get ours. That's not how we win. This is how I win. Saquon Barkley. The Giants were a disgrace in week one. Nobody, nobody saw what was coming down the pipeline there, but they got behind early from defensive touchdowns. It was raining. It was ridiculous. And now you're going into a dome. You're going into a bubble there in Arizona, into the greater Scottsdale area. Actually, it's not technically Scottsdale. It's Glendale, if we're going to be dead honest. But uh, I should know, uh, you know, spent a lot of time there. But either way, we are looking at Saquon Barkley to run amok. Last season, this was the go-to guy constantly for this New York Giants football team. He got blanked with just 12 carries, only the three catches that he had, but... Because of how far back they were in that game, they were able to take the load off of him. He's going to be fresher than the average bear going into Arizona here in week two. And somehow, someway, a guy who I'm projecting for around 20 touchdowns over the course of this season between the passing game and the running game has a plus 100 anytime touchdown against the worst defense in the NFL. The worst team in the NFL even money or better on Saquon Barkley just to score here? Take all of it you can. This is the best prop that we've had in the first two weeks, bar none. And it's weird because I don't find the anytime touchdown market to generally be that good of a market to bet. But I find this to be an incredible play. Saquon Barkley, anytime touchdown. Get ready, friends. He coming for you. We got three games to go. Hit that like button, subscribe button, notification bell as we head to a spot. I'm looking for a parlay. What you know about parlay? Well, I know quite a bit now because Aton, you know, he talks me into stuff all the time. He's like, hey, let's do this. Let's do that. I'm like, no, 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 no. Okay, fine. Yeah, let's do that. And you can check that out, of course, on X as we do NFL hot sauce as we give you the mild, the medium, and the hot. The hot this week. We did a four-player Two touchdowns or more parlay? That's disgusting. That makes me vomit a little bit. Let's go back to something a little bit more medium here. This is what I presented on that program. Big fan of it. The Washington football team, uh, commanders, if you will. I just thought football team sounded better. Uh, going up against the Denver Broncos. Denver, pretty inefficient stuff that we saw out of them with Russell Wilson at the helm. It will get better, especially if Jerry Judy can suit up, but doesn't necessarily mean that this Denver defense is just going to be extremely exploitable either on the other side. I don't think they're going to play in many high-scoring games up at altitude here in the year of our Lord 2023. This is not Sean Payton in New Orleans. This is going to be an aged-out Russell Wilson game managing, trying to make good decisions, good first reads, getting it out of his hands a little bit sooner, finding Sutton, finding Jerry Judy. Marvin Mims, why can't you be out on the field? I don't quite understand that one. Must be in the doghouse for something. I don't quite get it. But on the Washington side of things, this is a football team that I think goes into mile high and wins game number two of the season here. I think they start off 2-0. and The NFC East is way up this season. The Eagles, they're way, way up. But Dallas, I think they're much improved, especially when you start talking about the defensive side of the ball and what you saw in that week one beat down at the Giants. But Washington against the Cardinals here as well. Looking at everything across the board, friends, I think that they're going to be able to compete, not win the NFC East, but compete for a playoff spot based primarily on that defense. Going to be 
primarily going to be a defensive football team. But Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, nothing was all that problematic on the offensive side in the second half of that football game. Howell started making better decisions. Sam Howell out of North Carolina, somebody who can get it done with his legs too. It's a part of his game. We didn't see as much there, although did have a rushing touchdown in that week one win against Arizona. So friends, that was Duke. Those who know when Duke shows up on this program, good things happen. Friends, we want the under parlayed with the money line of the commanders. This is fantastic stuff, right, Duke? Okay, he, he's over it. Speaking of the NFC, speaking of those Dallas Cowboys, oh baby, oh baby, this is a game a lot of people are looking forward to in the most malicious of ways, but it's wild. Dallas opening as three-point favorites. Why is this line out of control? Well, you already know Aaron Rodgers out for the season. Yes, the savior of the New York football giants played four snaps before snapping his Achilles. That's wild. Again, I feel bad for Aaron Rodgers, which never, as a Vikings fan, I never thought that that could possibly be a feeling that I would have, but hope he recovers. We all do. Let's talk football and let's talk a bet here on this side of things. However, I think it's probably missed the boat. If you were able to just rapid fire and fire it up right away when it was three or three and a half, as soon as that injury went down, you're in a really good place. And you're really happy with your life. If you were like me and you weren't by your phone at that given point in time, and then the books ripped the line down. Well, you opened it up again to nine and a half. Now it started to dwindle back down to eight and a half here because the Jets defense is just that electric, just that good. But everything else besides the Zach Wilson, besides who's playing quarterback here, the Jets have a pretty good comp here to the Dallas side where they have an electric defense. They have skill position players in Pollard, C.D. Lamb, who didn't even need to get utilized in that 40 nothing beat down there of the New York football giants. But I would definitely be playing the Dallas Cowboys here in any kind of a capacity because it is Zach Wilson, one of the most inefficient quarterbacks that we've seen come out of college in quite some time. The BYU product He's going to be asked to game manage. He's going to be asked to do all the small things, but he's not going to be able to succeed at it. Left roses by the stairs just so he could let the 40-year-old he slept with know that he cares. <laughs> Zach Wilson, MILFs. <laughs> Dallas minus eight and a half. I really have nothing from this game. It's a disgusting one. Everybody's going to want to watch it. Everybody's going to want to see Zach Wilson fail. You can't even bet the over of half an interception anymore because it's just out of control. Oh, man. Hopefully you have Dallas defense in fantasy. And our last game of the night, this is a fun one to be able to finish on because the Miami Dolphins, they brought the absolute heat to the Chargers. Tyreek Hill brought the absolute pain to the Chargers here. They're taking on New England, who came back in a pretty prominent fashion against the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, a team that... I'd say has been lackluster on the offensive side besides some big plays. Besides DeAndre Swift now in week two, didn't even play in week one, really. Just absurd. Just absurd. But anyway, this open at minus two. Miami's taking money. That shouldn't surprise anybody when you have Tua Tugavailoa looking as efficient as what he did in that spot and having Tyreek Hill go for over 200 bills. That'll probably do it as well. But as I look at the matchup between these two, it all comes down to what is Mac Jones going to do? You obviously don't want him throwing the most passes in week one. That's what he did. You don't want him throwing the most passes out of anybody. That usually means you're in comeback, uh, come from behind fashion. And why would you want Mac Jones throwing it more than 50 times in any football game ever? Answer, you don't. There you go. Simple as that. But as much as you want to focus on the passing attacks from both these teams, and I love Jalen Waddle, like my child that I don't have. I love Tyreek Hill, not in that kind of way, just the football talent, because he seems like a pretty shitty dude. And the New England Patriots, absolutely a big fan, big fan of Ramondre Stevenson, even though it's going to be a terrible, terrible, no good, very bad season for him. However, looking at the running attack from the Dolphins side, this is a clear-cut, broken line that I expect to change drastically on Raheem Mostert. It was limited in practice. People were saying, oh, trending towards not playing. Practiced in full on Friday. Their final practice report looks like he's going to be clean, scotch-free, ready to rock in New England here at Gillette 
on Sunday night. So pretty simple to me that he is going to see all of the running back snaps right from the get-go, that there is no issue you should have. Salvin Ahmed, all these other guys, Jeff Wilson on the IR, it's as clear-cut as ever. And I expect them to still find success through the air. They just have to get Raheem Mostert going a little bit more. Had early success in that football game before it just became the Tyreek Hill show and the back and forth with the Chargers. So Raheem Mostert sitting at 45 and a half rushing yards at standard juice. If this thing doesn't close closer to 50. I'm not going to eat my hand. I'll think of something else. But Raheem Mostert grading out really, really nicely for me. Want you to have the primetime play over 45 and a half rushing yards here for the bell cow back for the Miami Dolphins. And that does it for another edition of Liddy's Leans, Likes, and Locks. You know what to do. Go to that comment section below. Let me know your favorite plays for NFL Sunday week two. Going to be great stuff. I'm going to be breaking it all down from a DFS perspective on Stochastic, uh, live before lock there. You can check that out at the Stochastic YouTube channel. Talking fantasy, talking some of my favorite bets then as well. You can sign up for Caesar Sportsbook below. Bet $50 to get yourself $250 in the form of five $50 bonus bets. Good stuff from our friends at Caesars. Thank you to producer Jacob here. Nice to have him on hand for week two here of NFL Liddy's Good Stuff, friends. Until next time, I'm Eric Lindquist. Best of luck in the NFL streets on Sunday.